In this video, I've brought together 10 of my best brew day videos, but I've shortened everyone down so you're getting the most important bits. How to brew these beers and if they actually taste any good. This video is chaptered so you can jump to the recipes you want. I've also added links to allow you to jump to the original full versions of each video. I've got rid of all of the music I previously used in these videos so you're really getting the recipes with no distractions. So first up, let's make a carrot bitter. My malts were five kilograms of Maris Otter as a base malt. Maris Otter felt like the best option for this bitter as it has a bit of a nutty and biscuity taste which should complement the carrots. I added 500 grams of torrified wheat for body and head retention. I also put in 300 grams of caramel for color and a slight toffee note. My final malt was 200 grams of crystal rye for color. Apart from using half a Camden tablet to remove the chlorine, I did no water treatment. My tap water is very similar to the London water profile, which is perfect for bitters. During my hour long mash, I did monitor the pH and control it using lactic acid. Whilst the mash was going on, I prepared my hops. My first hop addition at the start of the 30 minute boil was 100 grams of East Kent Goldings. My next hop addition was 30 grams of Fugal 10 minutes before the end of the boil and 30 grams more of Fugal at the end of the boil. After my hops were ready, I prepared my one kilogram of carrots. I did this by chopping off the ends and then chopping the carrots into smaller chunks. On reflection, I probably should have cut these carrots up smaller than this. I then added them to a roasting pan along with 500 mils of water and roasted them for an hour. But again, on reflection, I feel like I should have roasted them for longer to have got more of those caramelized sugars out. When my mash was over, I then removed the grain bag and squeezed it, leaving it to drain. For some reason, I found this incredibly difficult this time round. To save time, I started heating up the wort whilst the grain bag was dripping into it. Once the carrots had finished roasting, I separated the carrots from the juice and added them to a mesh bag so that they could easily be removed later on. I put the juice straight into the wort. I almost always go for a 30 minute boil these days to save time and money and there's plenty of evidence out there to show that it causes no issues. Once the boil had begun, I started my hopping routine. 20 minutes before the end, I added my carrots. 15 minutes before the end of the boil, I added my copper cooling coil, so to sanitize it. 10 minutes before the end, I added Irish moss and yeast nutrient. And when the boil was over, I started immediately cooling my wort to 38 degrees Celsius. Once it was cooled, I added it to my fermenter and made sure to cause plenty of splashing so to give the yeast plenty of oxygen to work with. I opted for Lutricovic yeast here as it has quite a subtle flavor and so should maximize the carrot taste. I then put a lid on and gave the fermenter a good shake so to add more oxygen to the beer. Oxygen is really important at this stage of a beer's life as it helps kick off the fermentation. I then popped the fermenter on a heat pad and used a blow off tube as I was expecting this to kick off quite aggressively. Within 24 hours, the yeast was working fast and hard and six days later, I bottled half the beer and mini keg the rest. This feels like the most appropriate glass to put it in. It's got a lovely golden hue to it. It could be because of the carrots, but it's probably going to be because of the grains. So let's check out its aroma. Feels like it's quite spicy and a bit earthy. That's probably going to be from the hops, but I could convince myself that it's because of the carrots. I'm really pleased with its head retention. It looks very appealing. So let's give it a taste. That's fantastic. Probably the best bitter that I've ever made and certainly one of the best beers. Really quite earthy in taste, bit of spice. I think I can taste a bit of the carrot, but maybe I need to eat a carrot to make absolute sure. Here's a carrot as a reference. Quite sweet, um, earthy. Right, <laughs> that's a carrot. Now let's have a taste of this. Yeah, I think there's maybe a little bit of a carrot vibe going on in there. I think a bitter is the best way to enjoy a carrot in a beer because it is quite an earthy and quite a spicy thing anyway. This beer is nice and biscuity. It's got a little bit of an earthy spiciness to it. That's going to be mostly from the hops, but it could be a bit from the carrots as well. It's got a great body and mouthfeel, which could be because of the carrots, but is most likely because of the wheat. So to fully pin down the carrot is quite hard. I do think it's there, but 
In hindsight, I probably should have done a split batch or have just brewed a very similar beer straight away without using carrot so that I could properly compare the two. But I'm really, really happy with this beer and I will try out more root vegetables in the future in my beers as I think it's a really fun, different way to experiment. Next is how to make a pale ale with Lutra Kvike yeast. As always, the first thing I did was to put 31 litres of water into the kettle and then add half a Campton tablet. I left this for 30 minutes to extract the chlorine from the water. I then started heating the water up to my target temperature of 71 degrees. I then prepared my water using the water profile that the apartment brewer gave for one of his previous pale ales. Beersmith 3 worked out that this required me to add table salt and Epsom salt to my water. For this brew day, I wanted to try out altering the water's pH before beginning the mash process so to save time and maximise efficiency. But I couldn't find my syringe. This resulted in me making a massive error. <laughs> I thought I could eyeball the amount of lactic acid I needed to get to my target pH of 5.6. I could not. At first this worked fine and I got to a pH of 6.7. However, I then accidentally glugged too much lactic acid into the water, resulting in the super low pH of 4. So after some frantic googling, I tried raising the pH and discovered that apparently calcium can increase the water pH. So I then crushed some of that up and added it to my water, which made the water fizz and did absolutely nothing to the pH. At this point, I had messed up my water so much that I could not confidently alter it anymore and so just got rid of it. Unfortunately, I had plans for the evening of this brew day and had already wasted so much time messing about that I had to just give up and wait until the next day to go at it again. So yet again I prepared my water with a Kempton tablet, table salt and Epsom salt and began heating it up. I then checked my pH and started adding lactic acid with the syringe I refound. I added it slowly a few mils at a time before testing it with my pH meter until I hit my target pH of 5.6. Well 5.5 but that was very close. I could actually get further into the process this time and so I weighed out my grains. For this recipe I used 4 kilograms of Maris Ossa as the base malt, 466 grams of Vienna malt for flavour, 347 grams of Amber malt to add a biscuity flavour and to darken the beer, and finally 200 grams of flaked barley for body. I still had a little bit more time before the water had hit temp, so I prepared my hop additions. The first was 15 grams of Centennial for the start of the 30 minute boil, 12 grams of Centennial for 20 minutes before the end, 8 grams of Centennial and 4 grams of Simcoe for halfway through, 8 grams of both Centennial and Simcoe for the 10 minute edition, and 40 grams of Simcoe and 20 grams of Centennial for a big hop stand at the end of the boil. I also later added 40 grams of Centennial as a dry hop, but I prepared that later. The full recipe is in the description. And if you're enjoying this video, then please do give it a like and subscribe to the channel. And let me know, what technique for dry hopping have you found gives you the best results? Once the water was up to temp, I added my grain bag and grains, stirring regularly to stop clumping. The grains reduced the water's temperature to my target mash temperature of 65 degrees C. During the hour-long mash, I stirred the grains and checked the temperature every 15 minutes, putting the burners on for a few minutes and stirring to stop scorching when the temperature dropped too low. This was the first outing for my giant whisk, which I found at a charity shop. I was jealous of Michael Keane of the Home Brew Challenge and I was so thrilled to find this for just £1.50. Once the overall mash time had got to an hour, I then began the process of mashing out the grains. In this process, you heat up the mash to 77 degrees C for 10 minutes so to denature the enzymes and stop them converting sugars. After that was done, I then drained the grain bag, squeezed it and left it to drip for 15 minutes whilst I got the wort boiling. 
I did not pour hot kettle water over the grain bag this time as I didn't want to alter the water's profile or mash pH. On reflection, what I should have actually have done is taken some of the water out of my kettle before starting the mash. Once the wort was rolling, it was time to start my 30 minute boil and add my first 15 gram hop addition. I then began the hop schedule I mentioned earlier. I tried not using a hop spider as I'm concerned that some of my beers have not been as hoppy as expected because of it. At 15 minutes I added my copper cooling coil so to sanitize it and at 10 minutes before the end I added yeast nutrient. At the end of the boil I added my hops and immediately began cooling the wort, stirring it so to help cool it quicker. Once it got to 85 degrees I then began a 15 minute hop stand. After that was done I then cooled the wort to 40 degrees celsius and added it to the fermenter allowing some splashing so to help add oxygen. I then prepared my muslin bag and magnets for the dry hop. Look, I didn't get much footage of this because just before I did it, my house's boiler broke and then I had to completely rush filming at the end because I was very stressed. So anyway, that dry hop was 40 grams of Centennial. I realised at this point that I had not left enough space between the hop bag and the fermenting beer. And so what happened is that I basically started dry hopping immediately. I later found out that this is a process called a dip hop and can have great results which was lucky for me. So finally it was time for me to add Lutri yeast. It took less than 24 hours before a healthy fermentation kicked in and at this point I released the magnet hops but they were already dry hopping at this point so I didn't really need to do that. (laughs) Just seven days after that it was time to bottle the beer. So I bottled after seven days. So as you saw I accidentally did something called a dip hop which actually was really interesting to do you know a different way of dry hopping beer and because it was kvike yeast I was able to bottle within seven days so it didn't have a detrimental effect on my beer in the end. Now a big thing that I do have to point out is that this beer did end up being 3.9% it was meant to be about five. Now I think this was because I didn't pour any water over my grain bag. This is because I didn't want to pour any kettle water over it after I'd worked so hard to get the right water profile. In retrospect what I should have done is grabbed some water out of my um, brewing vessel which had been treated before I had started the mash that would have made much more sense and then poured that over. I have no way of recirculating my mash so I can't do you know recirculating methods but I don't think it's affected the quality of the beer it's just you know not as strong as I was expecting it to be. I get asked about it often and there is a link in the description to uh, the paint pens that I use for my bottles. My fiance Charlotte um, is the one who writes this beautiful art on it um, because I have such terrible handwriting that she is forced into writing for me. Anyway let's um, open this bottle. So I feel like that's turned out how I wanted. It's not super, super clear. It's clearer than I was expecting it to be, to be completely honest. I, you know, I wanted a little bit of a haze. I wanted just that that natural look that a lot of uh, modern beers um, have. More and more breweries aren't using um, finings or any other method to clear the beer. So I wanted to have a go at doing that, you know, not use Irish moss or anything. And I think this is still a very attractive beer. So yeah, a lovely golden color, like a golden dark color. I think the Marisotta and the Amber Malt are giving most of the color. Um, A bit of that haze is probably also from Um, the flaked barley that I used in there. Nowhere near as hazy as I was expecting but this wasn't going to be a hazy beer. I just didn't want to use Irish moss in it. I wanted it to look like a modern beer. Smell wise? So smell wise I think I'm getting a bit of a like a piney grapefruit. Definitely that dry hop centennial that's giving a lot of that aroma. That's probably the best aroma that I've ever had from any of my beers and I feel like that's probably because of me actually finally getting my pH control correct and also the dry hop of course you know it's my first large dry hop that I've done uh, for ages. I forget 
how much of an impact um, a good dry hop can actually have on a beer's aroma. So let's give it a taste. Plenty of pine and grapefruit in that flavour. What I'm really noticing as well is the improved mouthfeel compared to my other beers. It feels much more of a, a like a full taste. What, what I'm finding interesting is that despite it being relatively low ABV, you know, 3.9, it still feels like thicker in the mouth. I think that's probably the flaked barley doing some of the work there, but also could be that uh, water profile which um, I feel like is having a big impact on this. Definitely on the, the lingering aroma. There's no like metally taste or anything like that. This definitely feels like the best water profile that I've used um, for my home tap water and really does prove that I can make a decent pale ale without having to use reverse osmosis or anything like that. Let's stick with Kvike yeast for another recipe and try out making a lager with it. This beer was ready to drink within three weeks and it's been um, about three months since I first bottled it and it's only got better with time. So this is how I made it. Water is an incredibly important element when it comes to making a lager and I knew that I could not use my tap water for this as it's very heavy and so I used bottle water and so I didn't need to do any water treatment. It was actually really nice to just on the brew day just pour all of the water that I needed straight from bottles. And uh, it's definitely something that I'm going to try again. So once all the water was in the kettle, I then got it up to my mash temperature of 65 degrees Celsius before adding my malt. As this was my first attempt at making a pseudo lager, I wanted to make the recipe incredibly simple. And so I only used two types of grain, my base malt, which was 3.9 kilograms of Pilsner malt, and then I also added 1.5 kilograms of Vienna malt. This was to add a little bit more color and also flavor. I mashed this for an hour whilst keeping my temperature at 65 degrees Celsius. I've dropped the mash temperature that I normally use to 65 recently. I used to do 67, but I feel like I'm getting much better results with 65 degrees Celsius. Whilst the mash was going on, I prepared my hop additions. I went for just a single hop with this lager, which was a hop that I'm definitely going to mispronounce. Hallertur Herzbrecher. Hallertur's Herzbrecher. <laughs> it's a German hop with balanced fruity and spicy notes. Um, it's very commonly used in lagers and it felt like a perfect one to use for my first try at making a pseudo lager. I used 50 grams at the start of my hour long boil. Normally I'm a big fan of doing a 30 minute boil, but because this is a lager, I really wanted this to be as clear as possible. So I know that doing a longer boil results in a clearer beer. And so I went for a 60 minute boil. My final hop additions were 15 grams at 30 minutes, another 15 grams 15 minutes before the end of the boil, and then right at the end of the boil I added another 25 grams of hops. 15 minutes before the end of the boil I also added my copper cooling coil so to sanitize it. 10 minutes before the end of the boil I added yeast nutrients so to help kick off the fermentation really healthily, and I also added Irish moss, this was to help keep the beer clearer. Once I finished the boil, I immediately started cooling down to my target temperature of 20 degrees Celsius. Uh, this is on the colder end when it comes to Kvike Lutri yeast, although you can ferment it even colder than 20 degrees Celsius. I wanted to go for the lower end because this is less likely for Lutra to put out any esters, and so it's going to have a cleaner um, taste and be a bit more like a traditional lager. I left the beer to ferment at around 20 degrees Celsius for two weeks before I then bottled it. I also put some of it into um, mini kegs, uh, which I used for a party on New Year's Eve, which uh, was very much welcomed by the host. So here it is. My first ever pseudo lager, looking really clear. You can see me through it. <laughs> I've kept these bottles that I'm using in this video um, in the fridge for about three weeks to try and help um, really make it as clear as possible. Uh, kegging this would have probably helped it become even clearer, but you know, bottling is the best option that I have. 
because I don't have any of the kegging gear. <laughs> I could have maybe made it even more carbonated than what it is. It's got a nice head and uh, bubbles, uh, which helps it look like a real lager, which I know it isn't. <laughs> yeah, very clean smell to it. I'm getting no esters from the yeast. Um, just the smell of the hops, which um, I think you get a bit of a sweet kind of spicy smell from it. So taste wise, very clean, um, a very smooth mouthfeel to it. It tastes lagery. Uh, <laughs> there's only so many ways I can say that it tastes like um, a decent lager. I know it's not truly one, <laughs> but this does taste quite close. An interesting element of this beer is that ingredients wise, it's the cheapest beer that I've ever made. One of my absolute favorite styles of beer to brew is an American pale ale like this one. Using Beersmith Free's water profile tool, I chose the hoppy water profile and adjusted my tap water with Epsom and gypsum. I stirred the salts in with half a Camden tablet and left it for 30 minutes to allow the chlorine to leave the water. Then I started heating the water to my target temperature of 72 degrees Celsius. Whilst it was heating up, I measured out my grains, which was 3.2 kilograms of Simpson's Best Pale Ale Malt, 1.8 kilograms of Pale Maris Otter. I then added 310 grams of Carapils for head retention, 151 grams of Melodolindin, 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 whatever this word is here, 151 grams of that for color and flavor. The full recipe is in my description. Once the water was up to temp, I added my grain bag and my grains, making sure to stir regularly to stop clumps. The grains reduced the water's temperature to my target mash temperature of 67 degrees C. I used a thick blanket to help avoid too much heat loss. I then gave the grains a good stir 30 minutes into the mash. After another 30 minutes, I checked the temperature again and then started stirring for 15 minutes so to get all those lovely sugars out of the grains. I then started draining the grain bag. I squeezed it and left it to drip for 15 minutes whilst I got the wort boiling. I was very lucky that I did double bag on this occasion, otherwise I would have had a complete disaster here. I also poured boiling water over the bag so to help get even more sugars out. Once the water was boiling, it was time for me to start the short 30 minute boil. First thing in was 23 grams of Magnum Hops at 30 minutes. Next was 50 grams of Pearly at 15 minutes, along with my copper cooling coil, so to sanitize it. 10 minutes before the end, I added Irish Moss, so to make the final beer clearer. And I also added yeast nutrients, so to ensure healthy fermentation. After that, it was 40 grams of Pearly and 16 grams of Columbus at five minutes. At the end of the boil, I added 25 grams of Columbus, got the wort to 85 degrees Celsius and gave it a 20 minute hop stand. At the end of that hop stand, I got the wort to 40 degrees Celsius and added it to the fermenter, allowing it to splash so to help add oxygen. In went my Kvaik Voss and after a bit of a shake, I put it onto a heat pad and left it to ferment for a week before bottling. So here it is. This is my Into the Pines APA. I love making APAs as they're so easy and they're great for using up hops and just like trying out different things. Now I did brew these months ago. <laughs> I've literally just got a chance to film this tasting. So this is one of the very last bottles. I've been really enjoying it. I'm looking forward to having one of my final ones with you. Now I did plan on calling this In The Pines, which would be a reference to a Nirvana cover song, but my fiance didn't hear me right when she wrote on it and so called it Into The Pines, which is a reference to nothing. Minor details that Noreen needs to know, but you know now. <laughs> now, I don't think it's over carbonated. Uh, I think I've possibly poured it badly. It's going well, it's going well. Let's talk about aroma whilst we're waiting for the foam to go down. Got a bit of the woods to it. Pour a little bit more. Nice looking ice cream. <laughs> don't know why this particular bottle is quite so excitable, but I will show you how clear it is. I can drink some of this. I'll just get a bit of a foam beard, I suppose. Bitter and piney. 
quite nice for autumn actually. Feels like right to be sat in front of a fire drinking this. Now it's definitely got that high bitterness and pepperiness that you'd expect from Magnum hops and Pearly hops. The Columbus hops also are giving it a bit of a citrus hit. It tastes like a liquefied uh, lemon tree. <laughs> I would say if you're making an APA that maybe you should brew it with some more accessible hops than the ones that I've gone for here. Let's make something a bit darker and go for an Irish red ale. As always, the first thing I did was to put 31 litres of water into the kettle and then added half a Camden tablet. I left this for 30 minutes so to extract all the chlorine. My tap water is naturally very close to the London water profile and so it suits balanced styles of beer like this without any alterations to the water's chemistry. You may want to alter your water's chemistry depending on what profile you have. I then started heating the water up to my target temperature of 71 degrees. Whilst I was waiting for the water to heat up, I grabbed my grains. For this recipe, I used 3.15 kilograms of Pilsner malt as a base malt, 1.1 kilograms of Munich malt for flavor, 250 grams of Carapils for flavor, 240 grams of flaked barley for body, 100 grams of amber malt to add a biscuity flavor and to darken the beer, and 50 grams of roasted barley. Using such a small quantity gives the Irish red ale its iconic red color. Whilst the water was heating up, I also prepared my hop additions, both of which were fuggle. The first was 30 grams for the start of the 60 minute boil. The second and final hop addition was 35 grams of fuggle, which were added 15 minutes before the end of the boil. My last bit of prep was to measure out the yeast nutrient and Irish moss, following the manufacturer's instructions, though adding a little bit of extra yeast nutrient because I'm using Kvike yeast. Once the water was up to temp, I added my grain bag and grains, stirring regularly to stop clumping. The grains reduced the water's temperature to my target mash temperature of around 65 degrees C. 10 minutes into the mash, I gave the grains a stir and took a sample so to test the mash pH. I used an Aperi Instruments pH meter, a link to which is in the description. Healthy mash pH is between 5.2 and 5.5, whereas mine was 6.2 and so needed adjusting. So I added 2 milliliters of lactic acid so to lower the pH. 15 minutes later, I gave the grains another stir checked on the temperature and then took another sample to see where the pH was. My pH was still way too high at 5.9 and so I added a few more milliliters of lactic acid to the mash. 10 minutes later I checked on the mash pH again and it got to 5.6 which I was much more happy about. Once the overall mash time had got to an hour I then began the process of mashing out the grains. In this process you heat the mash up to 77 degrees for 10 minutes so to denature the enzymes and to stop them converting sugars. After that was done, I then drained the grain bag, squeezed it and left it to drip for 15 minutes whilst I got the wort boiling. I then poured about 500 mils of boiling water over the grain bag so to extract more sugars and maximize efficiency. Once I had a rolling boil, it was time to start the 60 minute boil and add my first 30 gram hop addition of Fuggle. 15 minutes later, I added my other 35 gram hop addition of Fuggle as well as my copper cooling coil so to sanitize it. 10 minutes before the end, I added iris moss to make the final beer clearer and yeast nutrients so to ensure a healthy fermentation. At the end of the boil, I immediately began cooling the wort, stirring it so to help cool it quicker. Once the water got to 40 degrees Celsius, I added it to the fermenter, allowing some splashing so to help add oxygen. Finally, it was time to add my Lutra yeast, give it a shake, and then put the fermenter onto a heat pad. It took 24 hours before a rapid fermentation was kicking off and just six days after brewing, it was time to bottle. And there it is. Uh, that was one of my favorite brew days for a while. Um, I really liked the fact that there was only two hop additions. Felt like I wasn't constantly like chasing my tail, making sure that the next step was absolutely ready uh, in my hopping schedule. And I also quite liked the fact that um, I didn't have to do like a hop stand or anything like that. So it just meant that the moment that the boil was over, I was just cooling that beer and sticking it in the fermenter. So it felt really fast. It's been about a month since I bottled it. So uh, let's get one open.
There it is. First things first, is it red? Yes and no. Yes, it is red. There is red to it. I feel like on camera, you might not pick up the redness. There's certainly a red hue to it. It's not the reddest red ale I've ever seen, but I feel like that's because of the amber malt. I like the flavor that the amber malt has um, added to this. I, I, I've, I've had a few of these already. Uh, not today. <laughs> um, but yeah, I like the flavor that the amber malt has added to this, but maybe it did darken it up. But that said, when I get nice and close, it's red. It is red. Please see that it's red. It isn't orange. It's not brown. It's red. It's holding a nice head. It smells nice and malty. Bit of an iron smell to it, maybe? I also noticed on the brew day, this has just reminded me, Fuggle hops, right? They smell disgusting <laughs> when they're brewing. They're, I have a real aversion to the smell of them brewing. They, they smell and taste fine in beer. But is it me? Am I alone in this? Or Fuggle hops stink? <laughs> like, uh, lots of other hops smell amazing, but them ugly smells. <laughs> uh, anyway, right. So, we know it's red. It smells nice, bit metally, but I think that's okay. It's quite irony. Really interesting to have used Lutra yeast and just to see, uh, again, you know, second time that I've used Lutra and really don't get much yeast character from this compared to Voss, which could almost dominate the smells of some beers. It certainly would have been doing that to this one. All right, let's taste it. Mm. Yeah, pleased with that. I like the mouthfeel that it has. I feel like the flaked um, barley has really given it like a kind of grainy, but like like smooth mouthfeel to it. It's come out 4.5%, um, but I feel like the flaked barley is still giving it like a nice mouthfeel in it. It tastes a bit thicker than what you might expect from a 4.5% beer. It's nice and old manny. It really tastes like the kind of beer that you'd enjoy after a nice long walk in the spring or the autumn. You know, you sit down in an old English pub, there's a roaring fire and it's got an ale like this available. And the more I sip in it and the more I smell it, I can definitely smell them fuggle hops. Its clarity is so beautiful. Um, it's very clear. I know it's hard for you to tell how clear it is because it's brown. <laughs> well, not brown, red. But um, yeah, that's that Lutra is uh, uh, amazing and there's nothing floating around in it. It is just clear delicious beer. Pleased with how balanced it is. I think that's um, really quite an important part to this style. I feel like my granddad would enjoy this. I'd be interested to know what uh, Irish red tastes like with more modern hops. I know that there's quite a trend in America to try that out, if I made that up. I like the malt bill. Um, I feel like I'd like to experiment with the hops. Mm. And there are those biscuity notes that are coming from the amber malt. I feel like the Lutra uh, Kvike yeast is causing the beer to taste more professional. Um, that could also be me doing the pH alterations in the mash. So I think like all of that combining is helping make this beer taste better. I definitely will try and make an Irish red ale again, close to St. Patrick's Day next time round. I think I'll probably go for pure Marisotta as my base malt. I think I'd like to avoid any darker malts apart from the flaked barley next time so that um, I can make it more red. And maybe I should look into um, experimenting with different hops in this type of beer. You know, I do feel like um, some of the more modern hops could potentially boost this although I don't want to accidentally make it into an IPA. You know, there are plenty of other beers that are using modern hops, so maybe I shouldn't wreck this <laughs> by using the wrong hops in it. Thank you so much for watching this video. Please do give it a like if you enjoyed it and subscribe to the channel. And uh, let me know in the comments if you've ever made a red Irish ale and uh, how you felt about the process. And if you've ever used any other hops apart from Fuggle and did you find better results? I'm not saying that I hate Fuggle. I'm just saying that I feel like it's probably one of my least favorite hops out there. Maybe I've just insulted lots 
of people by saying that. Hopefully not. Um, I do still like this. <laughs> a couple of my favorite beers ever used fresh hops. Check out this golden ale I made using them. Using Beersmith Freeze Water Profile Calculator, I set my water profile for a hoppy beer and added the needed salts and Camden tablet. It will vary depending on your water, so you do need to learn your water's profile by going onto your water provider's website. I then moved the water to the hop and started heating it whilst I measured out my grains. In this recipe, I was trying to use up some of my grains and so ended up going with 1.83 kilograms of pale two row and 1.3 kilograms of Maris Otter, both to serve as the base malts. Then I added 1.19 kilograms of Munich malt for color and flavor, 500 grams of Pilsen for flavor and wheat malt for head retention. The full recipe is in this video's description. Watch you're there, let me know what your experience is of using fresh hops. Have you grown your own and what's the best beer that you've ever made using fresh hops? Once the water was at 72 degrees, I added my grains. The grains cooled the water to my target temperature of 67 degrees. I then put a blanket over the kettle and left it for half an hour before giving it a good stir and leaving it for another 30 minutes. At the end of that time, I gave it a stir for 15 minutes so to steep even more of the sugars from the grains. I then left the grain bag for 15 minutes to drain. I took this time to add two mils of citric acid so to lower the pH. After giving the bag one final squeeze I then got the water to a rolling boil for an hour. Whilst the water was heating up I measured out my hops. The measurements are going to sound crazy but when using fresh hops you need to use five times the weight of hops compared to pellets. My first hop addition of fresh challenger hops was 30 grams. My second was 50 and my final flame out addition was a whopping 60 two grams. 30 minutes into the boil I added my first load of hops. 15 minutes before the end I added my copper cooling coil, yeast nutrient, Irish moss and the next batch of challenger and at flame out I then added the rest of my hops and let them steep for 15 minutes at 85 degrees. Then I cooled the water 40 degrees and added it to my fermenter along with the Kvike Foss yeast and then left it for a week. So that was my brew day using some of my fresh hops to brew a golden ale. The biggest surprise I had during the brew day was just quite how much water absorption the hops have. So if I was brewing this again, I would add more water as I ended up with less beer than I was originally hoping for. Talking about the beer, here it is. This is my golden ale. I have had most of these already. This is a few months after I bottled it. Uh, I bottled it in August, this is currently January. Uh, so four months ago. Now this is quite an active little number so I will pour it quite quickly and delicately. There she is, a lovely colour, golden as you'd hope for a golden nail. A lovely head. I'm really pleased with its colour. It's not perfectly clear. It's got that strawy kind of golden hue that you'd want to get from a golden ale. So it's aroma. Quite spicy, fruity. I think you are getting some of the smell of Kvike yeast here. So Challenger hops should be quite spicy and floral with a bit of a citrus note. So that's what I'm looking for when I now take a sip. There is that citrus hit to it, followed by a spiciness, bit of an orange peel, and then spicy. Very drinkable. It's quite a bitter golden ale, maybe a bit too bitter than what you traditionally want to have a golden ale. When growing your own, it's quite hard to know what the IBUs are of your hops. You've obviously got the estimated IBUs that you can uh, work with, but it could be that because of whatever the weather conditions have been whilst they've been growing, um, and the soil and so on and so on, that the hops might be more or less bitter than what you were expecting. And uh, I feel like here it's a bit more bitter than what I was originally expecting. That said, I still think it's really nice to drink. I think it really does celebrate the Challenger hops. I really can't tell if there are any early bird in this, but I think Challenger is quite a powerful hop compared to early bird. And so just overwhelms it. So I'm going to say this is pretty much could be considered a single hop challenger beer. I really feel like it celebrates it. It's got those citrus notes. It's got those spicy notes. It's a lovely celebration of British beer here. Let's stick with the fresh hops and look at the strongest beer I've ever made, a double IPA. 
Before doing anything, I attach my hop bazooka so to stop the fresh hops causing a blockage when I add the wort to the fermenter. I use Beersmith Free's water profile calculator and I set my water profile for a hoppy beer and added the needed salts and a Camden tablet. I left the water for 30 minutes so that the Camden tablet could remove all the chlorine. I added a couple of litres of extra water to this recipe to account for the water absorption of the hops. Your water chemistry is going to be different to mine so look into the makeup of your water through your provider's website. I find that the hoppy water profile is really useful on Beersmith Free and it's the one that I go to most often. I then moved my water to the hob and started heating it whilst I measured out my grains. This is the biggest grain bill I've ever used. A massive 7.3 kilograms of Maris Otter as a base malt, 523 grams of Pilsen for flavour, 380 grams of Munich malt for colour and flavour, 165 grams of crystal malt 60 for head retention and flavour, 165 grams of flaked oats for mouthfeel and head retention. Whilst the water was heating up, I added my brewing bag, and once the water was up to 72 degrees, I added my grains. The grains cooled the water to my target temperature of 67 degrees. I then put a blanket over the kettle and left it for half an hour before giving it another stir and leaving it for another 30 minutes. After that time was up, I gave it a stir for 15 minutes so to steep even more sugar from the grain. I then did the hardest part of this big beer and began draining and squeezing that grain bag. I had to get some help from Charlotte to get it onto a sieve. I then let my grain bag drain for 15 minutes. After giving the bag a final squeeze, I then got the water to a rolling boil for an hour. Whilst the water was heating up, I measured my hops. Before I shock you with this part of the recipe, you do need to know that when you use fresh hops you need five times the weight of hops compared to pellets. These fresh hops are mostly challenger hops with a little bit of early bird. So my 60 minute edition was 72 grams, my 45 minute edition was 32 grams, next was my third edition at 15 minutes which was 60 grams and my final flame out edition was 220 grams. So altogether this beer contained 384 grams of fresh hops. Once the water was boiling I added my first hop edition and gave it a good stir. 15 minutes after that I added my next bunch of hops. 15 minutes before the end I added my copper cooling coil, yeast nutrient, Irish moss and the next batch of challenger. At flame out I then added my massive hop addition and let them steep for 15 minutes at 85 degrees. Then I cooled my wort to 40 degrees and added it to my fermenter along with some of my beloved Kvike Voss yeast. I then left it for a week to ferment and bottled. So that was my brew day. Um, if you watch my previous video about my golden ale using these hops, I realized quite late in the process that the hops are actually sucking up an awful lot of water, more water than I was expecting. So I did brew this with more water than I'd normally do. I don't know if I added quite enough extra malt because of this. And so the beer ended up being 7.4%, uh, 7.4%. So a bit lower than what I was expecting, but still within the range of a double IPA if this was being in a competition, which it's not, so I don't really care. But, but if you do care about those things, uh, then this is legit. Here it is. There she is. A wonderful head on that. A fantastic hop smell. Its smell is very similar to my um, golden ale. I'm recording these videos back to back, so about 10 minutes ago I was sniffing the golden ale, and yeah, they smell very similar, which is, is unsurprising considering that they've got the exact same hops in them. But uh, I suppose I'm interested by the fact that this isn't more hoppy. It doesn't stink in comparison, <laughs> despite the fact of having about five times more hops. So it's nice and clear, a really lovely golden colour. Really pleased with the colour. The head's holding and looks great. Let's taste it. Heaps of challenger, obviously. A really spicy note to it now. Big bit of citrus. It's got that bitterness uh, that you'd hope to get on such a um, hoppy beer. You know, it's a, about two kilograms of challenger in it. 
it's incredibly drinkable. For a beer that's 7.4%, I could easily um, neck a few of these. This is only the second double IPA I've ever made. Um, because of the brew in the bag method that I do, if I make anything that needs a big grain bill, then I have to brew on a day when I know Charlotte's at home so that she can help me lift the bag out so I can put it onto the sieve because I'm weak. Uh, but yeah, so I don't often brew double IPAs, but maybe I should actually because this is really delicious. The problem is though, you make a double IPA like this and it's really drinkable and then, you know, you drink two of them and you, you've gone to sleep. <laughs> so maybe one of the reasons why I stick to something more around the 5% range most of the time. Really drinkable, surprisingly easy to drink. You know, some 7.4 beers I've drank before, you know, you need to take your time on. You know, it's, a, it's an experience. This is <laughs> too easy. I think I prefer it to the golden ale that I made. I think that the Challenger's bitterness works really well in a double IPA. You know, the big malt bill seems to balance well with that powerful, spicy, citrusy hop. I feel like next year I would happily brew this exact same beer again if I had all of those hops. I think I'd probably swap out the golden nail for something else. I feel like it's made me want to uh, experiment with more double IPAs. I, I, as I said, I, I tend to avoid brewing them. They're hard because of the current brewing system that I have, because of the weight of the grain, because I'm feeble. Obviously they cost more to make because of the additional hops and grain that you need to add into it. You know, it can cost more than two normal brew days as such. Um, but then it depends on what hop you're using, you know, these were free. So I was quite willing to make a double IPA out of them. This next beer was inspired by Barack Obama's recipe for a honey porter. Because my water's profile is almost identical to the London water profile, I didn't need to alter my tap water's chemistry as it's naturally great for darker beers. I stirred half a Camden tablet into the water and left it for 30 minutes, so to allow the chlorine to leave the water. Then I started heating up the water to my target temperature of 72 degrees. Whilst this was going on, I measured my grains, which was three kilograms of pale marisotta as the base bowl, along with 500 grams of crystal malt, 400 grams of Vienna malt, 200 grams of flaked oats, 200 grams of Carafa Special Free, and 100 grams of chocolate malt. The full recipe, as always, is in the description. Once the water was up to temp, I added my grain bag and grains, making sure to stir regularly so to avoid those cursed clumps. The grains reduced the water's temperature to my target mash temperature of 67 degrees C. I used Use a thick blanket to help avoid too much heat loss. I gave the grains a good stir after 30 minutes of the mash. After another 30 minutes, I checked the grain's temperature and again stirred it for 15 minutes so to get all the lovely sugars out of those grains. I then drained the grain bag and gave it a good squeeze and left it to drip for 15 minutes whilst I got the wort boiling. Whilst that bag was draining, I measured out my hops, all of which were 25 gram additions of East Kent Goldings. One at first wart, one at 10 minutes, and one at flame out. I went for a first wart addition so to maximize bitterness while still having a short boil. I also used this time to prepare my honey as it began to solidify. The easiest way to sort honey out like this is to submerge the jar in boiling water. Once the wart was up to boiling, it was time to start that 30 minute boil. 15 minutes before the end of the boil, I prepared my copper cooling coil and put it into the kettle so to sanitize it. 10 minutes before the end, I added iron Irish moss to make the final beer clearer and yeast nutrients so to ensure a healthy fermentation. Five minutes before the end of the boil, I added the honey and stirred it in to avoid scorching. At the end of the hop stand, I then got the wort to 40 degrees Celsius and added it to the fermenter, allowing some of it to splash so to help oxidize it. In went my Kvike Voss yeast and after a bit of a shake, I put it onto a heat pad and left it to ferment for a week before bottling. So here is the honey porter, came out 4.5%, which I think is bang on for a beer like this. You can have quite a few of them, sat at a fire. So immediately get a big hit of, um, of that multi toasty, roastiness kind of smell. So let's give it a try. 
bit of like a liquid Marmite vibe to it. Like if Marmite was made into a drink, which I think it has recently, <laughs> um, then this would be it. Yeah, I'm not getting any honeyness to it. The thing is though, you wouldn't really. There's a real allure to using honey in beer because you think, oh, it's gonna taste like honey. It's gonna be so sweet and delicious. But honey is almost completely fermentable. And so actually what happens is that you put the honey in and about 95% of it is sugar which gets converted into alcohol. And so you can actually end up with a thinner beer. It's not really providing any mouthfeel. There's a slight floralness that honey will give, but to be honest, it's so malty that it does make me think why a honey port is a thing anyway. Uh, it just sounds nice. It sounds exciting. It's like, ooh, honey. But uh, I think the impact that the honey has on this beer is so minor. I mean, I suppose the experiment is to make the exact same porter, but one with honey, one without honey. Maybe I'll do that one day on my long list of things that I suggest I should try out and then never have the time to. But yeah, I just I just don't know what the honey's doing. I added the flaked oats to try and avoid losing any mouthfeel, you know, try and thicken it up a bit to offset the honey. I suppose the thing is, is that in a pinch, if uh, you need a beer to be a bit stronger and you haven't got any malt, <laughs> then you could boost it a bit with honey, but you're better off using malt. I've only ever made one Philly Sour, but it's one of the best drinks I've ever made. As always, the first thing I did was to prepare the water, pouring 30 litres of it into my kettle. I decided not to alter my water chemistry. As you can see here, I used this brew day to do some testing of using my attractive head cam. Into the water I stirred a Camden tablet and left it for 30 minutes so to allow chlorine to leave it. Then I started heating the water up to my target temperature of 72 degrees. And whilst that was heating up, I measured my grains. It was simply 5 kilograms of pale marisosa and 750 grams of Vienna malt. That's it. The full recipe is in the description. Once the water was up to temp, I added my grain bag and grains, making sure to stir regularly to stop clumping. The grains reduced the water's temperature to my target mash temperature of 67 degrees C. I used a thick blanket to help avoid too much heat loss and gave the grains a good stir 30 minutes into the mash. And after 30 more minutes, I checked the temperature again and started stirring for 15 minutes so to get all the sugars out of the grains. I then drained the grain bag, squeezed it and let it drip for 15 minutes. Whilst doing this, I knocked my camera and gave us this jaunty little angle. It was then time for me to try out my latest bit of kit, this wonderful pH meter. pH control isn't absolutely vital when it comes to brewing beer, but it is very, very important when you were brewing sours. I spent ages researching which pH meter to get, and I ended up going with the Apera Instruments a1209 pocket tester, a link to which is in the description. My first job was to get it calibrated ahead of testing a sample of wort I'd put in the fridge to cool. For this recipe, I needed to have a pH of around 5.3, so with this 5.8 measurement, I needed to reduce the pH little with some lactic acid. This is the point where things begin getting very different compared to a normal brew day. Instead of getting the wort boiling, I shut the lid and left the wort for a few hours so to cool it to 32 degrees C. Later in the day it was time to add some lactobacillus, the bacteria that helps sour a sour. I opted for the more budget friendly option, Yakult. It's packed with good bacteria and it's a fraction of the price. I believe in America you can use a brand that's similar called Good Belly here, but I've never used it because I live in the UK. It's then time to leave it for a few days whilst taking regular pH readings. Once you get to a pH between 3 and 3.5, you know that it's sour. Now mine was just shy of this, but I had no other time to brew, so I just had to go for it and start boiling. This is a really good time to taste the wort and see if it's souring and to see if there's any off flavours. Fortunately, mine tasted great and sour. So whilst I was heating it up to a rolling boil, I got my hops ready. This requires a very small hop addition of 15 grams of Chinook, which is boiled for the whole hour. To be honest, you can put any hop here really at this stage. It's a very, very minor part of the flavoring. Once the water was boiling, it was time to start the 60 minute boil. The great thing with kettle souring is that boiling everything in the same vessel as what it's soured in means that the equipment will not get infected. It also means that the wort won't later on infect my fermenter with bacteria as all that bacteria will get killed 
chilled off when I boil it. Once the hops were in, there was very little to do apart from prepare some yeast nutrient and Irish moss. 15 minutes before the end, I added my copper cooling coil, so to sanitize it. And 10 minutes before the end, I added Irish moss to make the final beer clearer and yeast nutrient, so to ensure a healthy fermentation. At the end of the 60 minute boil, I then cooled the wort down to 40 degrees Celsius and added it to the fermenter. In went my Kvaik Voss yeast, and after a bit of a shake, I put it on a heat pad and left it to ferment for a week before the next stage. The next part of the process is adding the fruit to the fermenter. I use three large packets of mixed frozen berries for this sour. Most frozen fruit doesn't have any nasty additives, which could be bad for your yeast, but make sure you do read the ingredients. After the fruit was blended, I then added Camden tablets, so to kill off anything which might infect the beer. You need one Camden tablet for every 500 grams of fruit, and once mixed in, you must leave it sealed for 24 hours in the fridge. I wrongly used some sanitized tin foil here, as at the time I had no tubs big enough for it all. I do have one now. I believe this is why some of my fruit went slightly brown over the 24 hours. The next day is when you finally get to introduce your fruit to the beer. My original plan here was to put all the fruit into the sanitized mesh bag, but in the end, my bag was way too small, so I was forced to pour the juice straight in. I ordered a much bigger one straight away, so to avoid drama in the future. Three weeks later, it was time to bottle. I was delighted when I first opened the fermenter to see no infection. Because I was not able to use that mesh bag, I had to be quite creative and use this hop spider ahead of bottling so to help avoid the seeds making their way into the final product. And after all of that, it was time to bottle my sour and wait a couple of weeks before finding out if I had something that was remotely drinkable. So here it is. This is my sour. Um, as you saw in the video, it's quite a stressful experience, especially when you're doing it the first time. Loads of different steps that can go wrong, and I honestly thought that this was going to be horrendously infected, uh, but it's not. <laughs> Look at that. Beautiful little head. It doesn't stay for very long, but it is uh, in existence, and it's on its way out. I think that's normal for sours. So hopefully you can see it in the video here is how ridiculous ridiculously clear this beer is. It is probably the clearest beer that I've ever made, which uh, really surprised me because of all of those seeds and all of the various bits of uh, matter that came from the berries. I was convinced this was going to be hazy as. I've already brought a new mesh bag, so I'm really looking forward to the next time I make a sour and uh, don't have to panic so much when I add the fruit. So, aroma. Smells sour, smells like berries. Let's taste it. Oh. It's tart. It tastes like berries. It's drinkable. This really is a surprise to me. I honestly thought that I was going to make a very bad beer here. Um, me and Charlotte have had a few of these and she has enjoyed it. It does mean that I now need to make more sours in the future. Uh, so to make sure that she's always got some on the go. I think its color is absolutely gorgeous. I love it. It looks, it's like a nice cherry red. The blend of berries that I got from Aldi were really nice for this. I probably would recommend using them certainly because they were the cheapest berries there. So if you're trying this for the first time, then you should definitely use those. The Yakult did what it was meant to do and soured it. There's no like off sour taste, so it does feel like the lactobacillus in the Yakult did its job, soured it in the correct way. Really pleased, because there are so many more steps. This is not an entry level bit of brewing. In fact, it's probably the most complicated recipe I've ever followed, um, just because there's so many moments that you can absolutely wreck the whole thing. The Kvaik yeast did its job. I love Kvaik. You may have noticed from my other videos, I almost exclusively use Kvaik Voss. And so far, I've found nothing that that yeast is not capable of. A few things that I would change. I think if I did this same berries, I maybe would increase the number of berries that I used. You know, really give it a fruity punch. I would definitely change the fruit just to see what different fruits do. Maybe a mango one. Uh, I think that could be really tasty. Pineapple. I think a pineapple sour could be nice. The Yakult is so much cheaper than buying specific brewing bacteria and it did the job. Let's finish this video with a Christmas themed beer that can be enjoyed all year round. A chocolate orange stout. 
Because my tap water is almost identical to the London water profile, I rarely need to alter my water chemistry for darker beers like this. I then lit the burners and got my water up to the target temperature of 72 degrees. Whilst the water was heating up, I began to measure out the grains, which was three and a half kilograms of pale Maris Otter as the base malt. My other malts were 420 grams of chocolate malt to add that toasty chocolate flavor, 260 grams of crystal malt for color and head retention, 260 of roasted barley to give that characteristic flavor of stouts, and 600 grams of flaked oats for mouthfeel. I also prepared some of my other ingredients. I measured out 500 grams of lactose sugar. My only two hop additions were 33 grams of fuggle for the start of the 60 minute boil, and another 33 grams of fuggle to be added in the last 30 minutes of the boil. I also measured out Irish moss to help clear the beer and yeast nutrients so to kick off a healthy fermentation. Once the water was up to temp, I added my grain bag and grains, making sure to stir regularly to stop clumping. The grains reduced the water's temperature to my target mash temperature of 67 degrees. I used a thick blanket and then gave my grains a good stir 30 minutes into the mash. Another 30 minutes in, I checked the temperature again and started stirring for 15 minutes so to get all the sugars out of the grains. I then drained the grain bag, squeezed it and left it to drip for 15 minutes whilst I got the wort boiling. Once the wort was boiling, it was then time to start the 60 minute boil and add my first hop addition. Whilst that was boiling away, I began to prepare my oranges. I zested 10 fresh oranges to give my stout its oranginess. 30 minutes into the boil, I added my second hop addition. 15 minutes before the end, I added my copper cooling coil. Five minutes later, I added my Irish moss and yeast nutrient. Five minutes shy of the end, I added my orange zest. And at flame out, I started cooling the wort and added the lactose. I then got the wort down to 40 degrees Celsius and added it to a fermenter, allowing some splashing so to add oxygen. And then in went my Kvike Voss yeast. And after a very good shake, I put it onto a heat pad and left it to ferment a week before bottling. So there we go. That was uh, my brew day. I really enjoyed using oranges. Uh, it was a really interesting addition and uh, it took way longer to zest them than what I was expecting, but I got it done. So here it is. I ended with a higher final gravity than what I was expecting. It uh, is about 3.8%, uh, but I'm still really pleased with it. And it, you know, 3.8% means that you can drink even more of them on Christmas day. So let's open one. See, it's not like spilling out. So this makes me very strongly believe that it had stopped fermenting before I bottled it. Look at that. That has got the iconic kind of color that you'd expect to have on a stout. Smells fantastic. I'm really proud of the fact that it has a very strong orange smell. You get that roasty, toasty smell that you'd expect from a stout, but then there is that undeniable orange zest to it. And the taste? I think it's got a very complex flavor. It clearly is a stout. It's malt forward, very drinkable. It's got a nice mouthfeel to it. There is an orange taste to it, but I have to say it's not like super orangey and it's got a nice balanced sweetness. I feel like the orange element of it is very orange zest flavored. Now I know that's quite obvious because that's the only part of an orange that I actually used in this recipe, but it does make me think that maybe I should have done more than just the zest, maybe added juice, or I maybe infused orange with vodka and then added it in. Orange doesn't ferment well from what I understand. That's why you don't see orange ciders. So maybe that's why I am better off using zest in this recipe. Thinking more on if I wanted to punch up how orangey this beer is, then maybe I would have used maybe mandarin hops. I've heard that they add um, a great orange flavor to a beer, so maybe some of them or a different hop that is quite orangey. The only other element is the chocolatiness, which I think from the lactose with the chocolate malt in this beer, uh, there certainly is like a dark chocolatiness to it. But again, if I wanted to bump up how chocolatey this beer actually is, probably cocoa nibs could have been a good idea. With all that said, it's a really delicious beer. I'm really proud of it. I think it's actually one of the best dark beers that I've ever made. I highly recommend you give this a go and maybe if you fancy making it a bit more chocolate orangey, then you could uh, do my suggestions. I think next year for Christmas, I'll probably make the same beer again, but 
ramp up everything, you know, make it super chocolatey, super orangey, and see if we can make it sickly. <laughs> Thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, then check out some of my other Brew Day videos.